morning, everyone. As Ed was praying, I was thinking about uh, the time that we live in. Uh, the culture that we live in is pretty, uh, pretty chaotic. <laughs> um, the culture of our time is, is going down a path of, of corruption, it's going down the path of chaos, and it's going down a path of confusion. Uh, I won't take too much time to think about it, but if you turn on the news every day, you're hearing more chaos, more confusion, and more corruption that is happening in the world. Uh, and the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been placed here in the world to be a light in the midst of the darkness. It's supposed to speak life to death. It's supposed to speak truth to the lies that are here in this culture. And uh, sad to say, I think that the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ oftentimes adds more confusion to the culture and the chaos than clarity. I have this little thing that I just pulled out. My, my wife bought me this little thing to clean my glasses. I was back there trying to look at my notes before I came up here, and it's like I can't see a thing. So you pull out this thing, and you can clean off your glasses. And it got me thinking that in many ways, that's what we need. We need clarity. We need to be able to see clearly in the midst of the chaos and the confusion and the corruption in our day. The Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is called to be providing a clarion call of who we are, our identity. The Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to bring a clarion call when it talks about why we're here. Why are you here? Why were you created? The Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to tell people about where they're going, the destinies, the two destinies, and to warn people of the eternal destiny away from God. The Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to tell people about what their greatest problem is, the greatest struggle that they have. It's not outside of them. Their greatest struggle is within them, sin and rebellion against God. It's Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to help people to find out what is true and what is right. And the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to point people to Christ and that Christ is enough for all of those problems and all of those difficulties. But sad to say, because of the corruption and the chaos that is happening in our world, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ has struggled with being clarion and clear in that call. You know, it's the struggles with humanity start all the way back in the very first book, the book of the beginnings in Genesis. And if you remember back in Genesis, you and I were created, humanity was created dependent upon God. As we were created dependent upon God, we were also created dependent upon his counsel, that we will be molded and shaped by the counsel that we listen to. And that the counsel that you're following will mold you and shape you and you're dependent upon God. And all of that was great, Genesis 1 and 2, until Genesis 3 came onto the scene. And a new counselor came in and started to speak different words, speak lies for the truth, speak death instead of life, speak things that were going to produce hindrances of relationships. The relationship between husband and wife, between man and woman was just perfect back in the garden. The relationship between man and beast and man and the world was perfect. The relationship between man and God was perfect. Humanity walked with God and God walked with humanity. And all of that changed in Genesis chapter 3 because Satan attacked the very word of God. He, he said, did God actually say? He went all the way back and he took the Genesis, the, the foundation of life, and he says, God didn't say this. He attacked the word of God. But not only did he attack the word of God, he attacked the character of God. He said, God is holding out on you that there's something better for you. He's saying that God is not good. Not only did he attack the word of God and the character of God, but he attacked the consequences of God, that God is the ultimate authority. And why is this world such a mess today? Well, the world is such a mess today because it goes back to Genesis 3. We have failed to follow God's word, we have failed to trust God's goodness, and we have failed to submit to God's ultimate authority. Well, no more is that happening more so than in the church of Lord Jesus Christ or in units, the smallest unit in this world between a husband and a wife. 
God has laid out in scripture what he requires, what he decides as what he has determined. Man and woman, the world says that that's not even true. Marriage between a man and a woman, the world says that is not true. The attacks that are happening in this world is creating greater level of corruption and chaos and confusion. And the church needs to be clear in its call. Well, Peter has been talking about this idea of submission, this aspect of submission. We are called to submit, put ourselves under an authority, sub, put yourself under a mission or a purpose of our authority. That, that is what Paul, Peter has been talking about here. He started by saying we need to be submissive to the civil authorities. He then goes and he gives you an example of submission between a servant and their master. He, he talks in there about Jesus Christ and he says, gives you the example of Jesus Christ being the great submissive one. He submitted himself to his father's will so that you could be saved if you trust in him. Then he talked in, Gen, in Genesis, my, far, uh, my, far, my fault, First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, he talked about women and marriages. We'll talk about that, Lord willing, next week. But I wanted to start this week with men, husbands. I think there's a, the greatest breakdown in marriages are happening because of men and because of husbands. And so I wanna to talk to you today and I wanna give you four specific things that we are called to do for our wives. Four specific things that are coming out of this passage that will give a clarion call because all the mistreatment and all the mistreatment that is rampant and is predictable, it's redeemable, all the abuse that happens in our world, all the struggles that happen in marriage, God has an answer for those. God has solutions to our problems. So we need to understand what God says. So let's go back to that passage that uh, Ed shared with us earlier in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verse 7. First chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. It says this. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, ladies, uh, next week, Lord willing, I'm going to speak on six verses to you. I didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> One verse to men. I think part of the reason, and we'll tell you next week, part of the reason is because the culture that they were, growing, that they were living in was a hostile culture, and women had no rights. And I think that passage was talking about a woman who has an unbelieving husband and how you live in a hostile culture with an unbelieving husband. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, next week. But husbands, even though it's one verse, it is packed with things that we need to do as husbands. Well, let's start with the very first phrase he says here. He says, likewise, husbands. Now, he's, he's keeping in that context of the marriage relationship is under the submission. If you go back to chapter two, flip back to chapter two, verse 13 with me. It says, chapter two, verse 13, it says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So Peter has started this and he's talked about this hostile culture, this unsteady culture, this godless culture that you're living in and you're a Christian. And he begins with all of these indicatives, all these wonderful beliefs about what God has done for you to rescue you and to save you. He talked about that in chapter one and two. He talks about you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and he wants you to be lights in the darkness. And so he's laying out what Christ has done for you, what God God has done for you, and then he moves from those indicatives, the beliefs, to behavior, how you live, and how we live in the world, how we could be light in the midst of this darkness, is to first of all be submissive. You be submissive first, here in chapter thir uh, 2, verse 13, the civil authorities, the emperors, the supreme authorities, the governors. He talks about submitting yourself to those civil authorities. Then if you jump down in verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18, it's the servants be subject to your masters with all respect. So submit to those servant, uh, submit to those masters with all respect. He gives you the example of how that happens. He look at verse 21. 
For to this you have been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you as an example so that you might follow his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him, his father, who judges justly. He himself, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds we have been healed. We heard Pastor Doug talk about that. All of these verses pulled out of Isaiah chapter 53. Peter's just regurgitating Isaiah chapter 53. And then we see this last verse. For you were straying like sheep, but now return to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. He's saying, submit to the civil authorities. Submit as to your employers. Do that because Christ ultimately submitted to the Father for you so that you can be saved. Then he talks to the wives and he talks to the husbands. So I want you to think husbands... First, we're called to be submissive. We're called to be submissive to God, but there's a level of mutual submission between a husband and a wife. It's not the same. Men are called to be the leaders in the home. The husband is called to have headship in the home, but there's a level of mutual submission that happens between a man and a woman. If you hold your finger there and jump to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, And let's look at verse 21. Uh, Paul, once again, is doing the same thing. He gives all the indicatives in the first three chapters of what God has done for us in the gospel. And then in the last three chapters, he talks about the imperatives of how we're called to live. And he says in verse 21 here, he says, submitting, yourself, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then he goes, wives, submit to your husbands. As to the Lord, now most people tend to think that the marriage situation starts here in verse 22. I actually think it starts back in 21. There's a level of mutual submission, number one. Now wives are called to submit to their husbands because the husband is called to be the leader. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So both of them are supposed to submit to the uh, Christ. The husband is to be the leader in the home, and the wife is called to submit herself. But the husband's submission doesn't stop. He's called to submit to Christ, and he's called to submit even greater. We'll look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Is there any greater submission that I could offer my wife than to be willing to die for her, to give my life for her? That's the greatest level of submission that I can offer. Now, if you look further down, it talks about children in chapter 6. Verse 1, it talks about children, obey your fathers and your parents. So there's this level of submission. Even Jesus Christ, the second person in the Trinity, submitted himself to the Father for you. So you and I are called to submit as well. So let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. So likewise, husbands, be submissive, humble, we're not supposed to be ruling over our wives. We're supposed to be doing this in a level of submission to Christ and that we honor him and magnify him out of our lives in our homes. So be subject to him in every way. Submission, I think, is a, it's got this bad connotation today, but submission means just put yourself under this authority. And it's not just externally, but it's internally in my heart. I have a continual attitude to put myself under the lordship of Christ in my life. And if I do that, if Amy does that, if you do that in your homes, guess what ends up happening? God is reflected more or so in your life. Submission is not a reflection of inferiority or lesser worth. Christ constantly submitted himself to the Father, and he was not of lesser worth than the Father. He's co-equal with the Father and co-equal with the Spirit. But he put himself under the authority of, for uh, his Father here in his life. A wife is to submit to her husband, not to every man. A wife is to submit in such a way that is honoring God and you know, submission is just a natural response to loving leadership. If I can think about how much God loves me in Christ, I should just desire to put myself under his mission and purpose. And it, you husbands that are here, if you are lovingly leading your homes, your wife will willingly submit to you because it's easy to do. It's hard to do when your leadership is not loving and gracious. So... Let's look at the umbrella of submission. Four things I want you to think about before we close today. 
first question is this. Husbands, where are you spending your time? Question number one is, husbands, where are you spending your time? It says here, live with your wives together. Look at this passage here in 1 Peter 3, 7. It says, likewise, husbands, talking about submission, live with your wives in an understanding way. We're going to focus on the live with. It means to dwell with them. Back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This spending time with our spouse is so important. I got one finger out, three fingers point back. So many times we can spend so much time at work, we can spend so much time on activities, and we spend very little time with them. And I was convicted as I looked at this passage and spent time with this passage, just live with your wife. I didn't want to move off of that. Spend time with your wife. Dwell with your wife. That's in essence what the passage is saying. Dwell with her. And fine, I found that as you go deeper into that, it's not just dwelling with her um, in a physical way that you're in the same home or in the same bedroom, but you're supposed to be physically connected to her emotionally connected to her, mentally connected to her, live with her, dwell with her. How many husbands have a tendency just to run away from their wives, separate from their wives, find anything but time with their wives? And so my first question I have for you men is this. If we're called to be submissive to God, number one, where are you spending your time? Where are you spending your time? Are you spending your time living with your wife? Well, there's a second question I want you to consider. What do you know? Not only where do you spend your time, but what do you know? I think what he's getting at here is we're called to know God's word and to know our wives. Okay? It says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Understanding way. That actually literally means this, according to knowledge, which is interesting. So I'm, so, I'm called to live with my wife in an understanding way according to knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Well, it's clear that I got to get to know Amy. I mean, I've been with, I'm with Amy for 35 years of my life. And so, praise God. Yes, praise God. To be honest, I don't know why she puts up with me, to be honest with you. Um, but I have spent my life trying to get to understand her and know her. But I think that Peter's going even deeper than just understanding on a horizontal level. I think what he's saying is this. The more I know the gospel, the better husband I'm going to be for my wife. Right? The more I know the word, the better father I will be for my children. And so I think he's getting at this idea of knowledge, first and foremost, about who God is. Jump back with me to... 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Now let's go back to 13 to stay in the context. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, therefore, preparing your, what, minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that be bought Uh, be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ revealing. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Ignorance. He, He was talking there that you were stupid, you were foolish, you were ignorant at one time. There go my notes. That's good. All right. Uh, Stupid, ignorant, foolish at one time. Boom. Um... But God enlivened you. He gave you truth in the midst of falsehood. He gave you hope in the midst of hopelessness. He gave you light in the midst of darkness. He gave you life instead of death. He gave you something new. He moved you out of ignorance to hope and and the truth in your life. So he said that, that you've moved from ignorance. Jump to verse chapter 2, verse 15, because it's something similar. 2.15, it says this. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the what? Ignorance of foolish people. So once again, it's this ignorance in light of truth and hope and wisdom. I think what Peter's getting at, I think the thrust here is this. Husbands, keep loving your wife in accordance to knowledge that you are a Christian. According to the knowledge of the gospel, according to the knowledge of the word, the more you know the word, the more it's going to change you internally and externally. 
See, to live with our wives in knowledge requires us to understand God's word. It means I need to understand my wife, yes, but I need to understand God's word. I need to understand what he has done for me in the gospel. And as I remind myself of that day after day, it transforms how I treat my spouse. So question number one is, what what do you spend your time on? You need to live with your wife. Question number two is, what do you know? You need to know God's word, and you need to know your wife. Question number three is also important. What do you value? What do you value? The passage says here, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Show honor to the woman as a weaker vessel. All right, ladies, don't get caught up in the weaker vessel. We'll come back to that in a moment. I want you to focus on the honor piece. And men, more importantly, I want you to focus on the honor piece. To honor someone is to attribute value to them. It is to esteem them. It is to see them as precious. To dishonor someone is to view them as little or lesser or no value. In the culture that Peter's writing to, women had no value. They were pretty much slaves. Right after he talks about slaves, he then talks about wives. It's the culture that they lived in. They had no rights. And so what what Peter was saying is radically different. It's light in the midst of the darkness of that day that your wife has value and you should honor her as precious. Cherish her. See her as priceless. See her as precious. I don't know if any of you know Gary Smalley. Gary Smalley passed away, I think, last year, but... Um, he had this illustration um, of going to a kind of like a yard sale and finding a violin. And this violin is, it's got a broken bridge and the strings are popped and the owner is saying, you can have it for almost nothing. It has no value to me. And the guy buys this thing and takes it home. And he looks inside and he sees the phrase Stradivarius. And if you know Stradivarius, I mean, this violin is valuable. I mean, this violin could be a million dollars that you just purchased for nothing. And Smalley used the illustration that how many times is it that husbands, we treat our wives as nothing, piece of junk, when they're ultimately valuable. I wondered if I had that violin in my hands and I handed it to you, and as I handed this violin to you and you looked at it, how would you handle it when you thought it was junk? And then if I handed it to you and told you it was a Stradivarius, it was worth a million dollars, how would you handle it then? You'd look at it with awe and it's like you would want to try to protect it from being harmed. That is what God is calling us because your wife is infinitely more valuable than a Stradivarius. But men, sad to say, oftentimes we honor almost everything but the spouse that God has given us. So where do you spend your time? You need to live with her. What do you know? You need to know God's word and you need to know your wife. What do you need to do? You need to honor this woman. And what does it mean to honor them? Honor them maritally. To honor them maritally, as one pastor said, um, establish right priorities and become a a one-woman man, absolutely faithful to your wife. Honor her physically. Be strong for her, not against her. Be physically protective of her and present for her. Honor her emotionally. Be emotionally present and intimate. Take her out. Listen to her empathically. Don't try to fix her. Listen to her. Honor her verbally. When you speak of your wife, one of the things I couldn't stand about men's groups, I'll be honest with you, is that some men's groups, I know we don't have those here, but some of the men's groups I used to be in, all it was is just ripping apart our wives together as men. I couldn't stand it. It made me sick. I would tell the guys, and I'd say, if this is what we're going to keep doing, I'm leaving the group. Because it's not what we're called to do. Honor her verbally. Speak honorably to her. Speak honorably of her. When she is present and when she is absent, we should honor her. I guess women, you could do the same thing in your groups as well. Honor her financially. Provide for her. Honor her practically. Consider her needs. Honor her parentally. Be a parent dad. Honor her spiritually. Lead in prayer. Prayer. 
in all these ways we show that we honor them as special. But Peter doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say honor them. He says honor them as the weaker vessel. Now I know this phrase has gotten a lot of struggles and politically today it's not politically correct to call a woman a weaker vessel. But I, I think what Peter's got in mind is this. There are four things that I'm pretty sure he's not saying. First, I don't think he's saying that they are weaker constitutionally. On average, every woman in this room is probably going to live longer than their, their male, their spouse. It's just, just on average, women live longer than men, so it's not constitutionally. It's not intellectually. My wife blows me out of the water. I may have a bunch of letters after my name, but my wife intellectually blows me out of the water, and I know these men would say the same thing about their wives. It's not emotionally. I, I learn a lot about emotions from women because men, we struggle with understanding our emotions and expressing our emotions. It's not, it's not constitutionally, it's not intellectually, it's not emotionally, and definitely it's not spiritually. He'll talk about that in a moment. You're co-heirs in the gospel. So what is he talking about when he talks about weaker? I think he's talking physically and positionally. Physically, which is chaotic and confusing today, physically, men and women are just different. It doesn't mean that they're worse, it just means they're different. I was at a track and field meet yesterday. Watch my son run. The men's times are faster than the women's times. That doesn't mean that women are not valuable, but the women don't throw the discus as far. They don't throw the javelin as far on average. They don't throw the shot put as far as that on average. That is not diminishing you. It's just reality that men throw faster, jump higher, jump longer, I'm, run faster, and they're stronger. I know that there's some women in here that could tackle me in two seconds. I got it. <laughs> probably one sitting on the front row here. Um, <laughs> but physically, men are just different than men, women. And in this culture where women were not valued for their position, men were called to protect their wives physically because you're the physically stronger one. Don't ever take advantage of your wife. Don't ever lay your hands on your wife. Don't ever mistreat your wife, but protect her from also the world that is out there physically. But I think they're weaker as well positionally. They've placed themselves under your leadership. They live in a world where they have no value, and now they've placed themselves under your leadership. And then in the culture where they have no rights, they are vulnerable when they place themselves under you. Protect them. That's what Peter's saying. Protect them because you're physically stronger and protect them because you're positionally higher than they are. I actually circled two letters. Now, in my version, it says weaker. Does your version say weaker? Okay, everyone's version says weaker. If you chair, choose to do so, circle the ER. It doesn't say that men aren't weak. It just says that women are weaker physically. I'm weak. My body's breaking down. I am not the same as I was 10 years ago, 5 years ago. 20 years ago, and I'm definitely not the same as I was a year ago. We're all breaking down. We're all frail. We're on a path to death and ultimately to life with Christ. So we're weaker. We're frail. It's not that one is weak and the other one is strong. It's just that women tend to be a little bit weaker when we're talking about physically or positionally. So how should I treat my wife? I like this phrase, this thing from Matthew Henry. You probably have heard it before. The woman was made out of the rib, out of the side of Adam. Not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. I really love that. And so if, if us as men can think about that, that she's out of my side, She's here under my protection, and she's close to my heart so that I can love her. So the fourth question I have for you, because I asked you um, about your living. I asked you about what do you know. I asked you about what do you value. I, now I'm going to ask you about how gospel-centered are you? How gospel-centered are you? 
This was a challenge for me as well. Likewise, husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since, one, they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Next, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I need you to remind yourself that if you have a believing spouse, if you're a believing husband and you have a believing wife, you two are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You're heirs of God. You've been adopted. He talked about that in chapter one. You've been adopted into the family of God. You are equal in the sight of Christ. The ground before the cross is equal that you both are sinners and both have been saved by grace and you will be taken to heaven together in Christ. You're loved and accepted and secure and you're forgiven in Christ, equal in all ways. Man, you're just positionally different today. In fact, when we get to heaven, there is no marriage. So remember that you're people of God, but then he talks about your prayers. And it got me thinking, is he talking about my prayers to God alone? I think so. Is he talking about my prayers with Amy? I think so. He's talking about the fact that if I am not submitting to Christ, if I'm not trying to honor my wife by understanding her and honor her by valuing her, if I don't see her as a weaker vessel and try to protect her, then, and if I don't see her as a joint heir with Christ, I am going to have hindered prayers. That's scary to me. That my vertical relationship with God will be impacted by my horizontal relationship with this woman, my wife. The Bible talks about prayers not being answered. It talks a lot about it. And I'm just going to give you some of the reasons why your prayers may not be answered. Here's the first one, asking with the wrong motives. In James chapter 4, if you remember, he's talking about conflict. And he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And he talks about you adulterous people. So if I go to God with the wrong motives, my prayers will be hindered. One of the first things. The second thing that scripture tells us that my prayers may be hindered because I turn away from the word of God. In Proverbs 28, 9, it says, if anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. I talked about a culture that's going down the path of corruption and chaos and confusion and rejecting the very word of God when it comes to man and woman and husband and wives. And when you do that, and if this culture is doing this, their prayers will be hindered. In fact, they're deemed as detestable in God's eyes. Rebellion or disobedience tells me, scripture tells me that if I am rebelling against God and if I'm disobedient against God, guess what? My prayers will be hindered. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 42 and following, it says this, but the Lord said to me, tell them, do not go up and fight because I will not be with them. You will be defeated by your enemies. So I told them, but they would not listen. You rebelled against the Lord's command and in your arrogance, you marched up the hill country and the Amorites who lived there in the hill country came out against you and chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down. See, we tend to think that we can go and do it on our own, and when we rebel against the very word of God, guess what? Your prayers will be hindered. Men, how about this? Impatience will hinder your prayers. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, he, he rewards those who earnestly seek him that God is is going to reward you if you're earnestly seeking him, but if you are rebelling against him and showing impatience in your heart, guess what? Your prayers can be hindered. Indifference is another reason your prayers can be indifferent, um, hindered. Proverbs 1, 27 through 28, when calamity overtakes you like a storm and when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call out to me, but I will not answer them. They will look for me, but I will, they will not find me. See, when I turn indifference towards God and indifference towards humanity, guess what? Prayers are hindered. Idolatry. In Ezekiel chapter 14, it says, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? 
God says, if you're turning to idolatry, why, am I, why should I answer your prayers? Why should I even hear your prayers? This is another one for marriage. I can't tell you how many marriages struggle with this one, unforgiveness. In Mark 11, 25 through 26, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your sins. A couple more. Stubbornness. In Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 through 13. But they refuse to pay attention. Stubbornly, they've turned their backs and they stopped their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or the words of God Almighty. And I sent my spirit in the earlier prophets, so the Lord Almighty was very angry. When I called, they did not answer. So when they called, I would not listen. Last one is unbelief. And in Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and he will reward those who earnestly seek him. You know, verse after verse, I can give you even more, that talk about not showing mercy or unconfessed sins, or here in this passage, not respecting one another. Those will hinder your prayers. So what's Peter saying? Peter says, submit yourself to Christ's leadership in your life, men. That as you submit yourself to Christ, because Christ submitted himself to the Father for you, you need to live with your wives, dwell with them. Through the ups and downs, be with them. You need to know them. You need to know his word. You need to study the word. But then you need to be a lifelong student, not only of the word, but you need a lifelong student of your wife. Get to know her. And then what do you value, men? Honor her like a Stradivarius, even greater than that. When you hold her in your hands, value her as special. And see her as a weaker vessel, ER vessel, less than you, weaker than you. Weaker, not intellectually, not constitutionally, not emotionally, not spiritually, but weaker physically or positionally. They put themselves in a vulnerable position with you. Honor them. And then how much is the gospel reigning in your life and in your home? Remind yourself that that Christ has sacrificed himself for her and for you. See them as an heir. And pray with her. And pray for her. In closing, I'm just trying to think of some ways that we can apply this. And for men, I will tell you, probably this is the counsel I've given men Over 30 years, you need to take time to listen. Men have a tendency to try to fix it right away and not sit down and listen. That's a bad thing to do. Um, Listen and understand your wife's needs and understand their feelings and, and seek to empathize with her. Put yourself in her shoes. Feel with her. Now, you may not always agree with it. That's okay right now. I'm not saying that you have to agree with her viewpoint necessarily, but you need to at least be willing to listen to her viewpoint and hear it. And when you do that, and when you empathize with her, give her a perspective that you honor her and you value her out of your mouth and out of your life. I want you to think men, I want you to look for practical ways to love your wife. My wife is a great cook. I can always say that she's made a great meal, but can I think of other ways that she, I I can show practical ways of loving her and respecting her. I know my wife is a servant type person. She likes it when people serve. So when I can serve her, guess what? I can bring her flowers. That's not going to amaze her as much as if I were willing to serve her. I know that about my wife, so serve her. What do you need to know about your wife? I want you to embrace the equality of your wife as they're co-heirs with God. Co-heirs with you. They're they're adopted into God's family alongside of you. They're co-heirs. I want you to think about conflict. Ken Sandy talked about the fact that conflict is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to glorify God. It's an opportunity to grow, to become like Christ. And it's like an opportunity to serve one another. I want you to think of your conflicts that way. I want you to think of your conflicts in such a way that I'm going to grow to become like Christ through this conflict. 
even if my wife is misbehaving, or sinning, or whatever, can I learn through this? Because clearly I sin against her in so many ways. Use the conflicts and the challenges in your marriage to greater levels of humility and a willingness to compromise. When you do that, guess what? You honor her. And prioritize prayer in your marriage. Ask God for wisdom and guidance and strength to love your wife and to honor her and to love your children as he desires. Guess what, men? If we live with our wives, if we value them, if we look at them as special because they're heirs, if we protect them, if we let the gospel reign and rule in our lives, what would happen in marriages in this church? What kind of light could we be in the darkness of this world? What kind of life could we be to the death that is happening around us? What kind of truth can we show to the falsehood that is out there, radically different? That they'll know you are Christians by your love for one another. Would you pray with me? Father, as I look at this passage, I was humbled. Um, One, by the fact that you're calling me to submit to my wife in a mutual way because your son submitted to you. And the greatest level of submission is this. He said, greater love hath no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be willing to submit even to that point of being willing to lay down our lives for our spouses. Father, you said, likewise, I pray that we would honor them and understand them. So, Father, help us to know, help us to be students of your word, lifelong students of your word, and lifelong students of our wives. Help us to be constantly, maybe even taking notes of things that we learn about our wives and, and to learn and grow how we can love them more. Father, I pray that you would remind us of what we value. We value so many things in this world. Some of us value our cars. Some of us value our homes. Some of us value our possessions. Help us to see this beautiful blessing that you've given us in our spouse and see them as valuable, infinitely valuable. Your child you've given to us. And Father, I pray that you would let the gospel reign and rule in our marriages, in our homes, so that we become a light in the midst of this dark world. Father, for all the chaos, for all the corruption, for all the confusion, I pray that you give us clarity in our homes, in this church, and in this community for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 